Fashion and I'm here to learn more about empowering women in the tech industry. Hi, my name is Neha. I'm here from uh, India. Uh, I'm representing my company that I founded which is Whiskers Marketing. And why I'm here, I want to know more about South Africa, what it's like in the startup zone and I'm completely thrilled by Startup Grind right now. Really will wish to come here again. Thanks. Hi, I'm Caroline. Um, I'm from Skyman Capital and I'm here to network and learn more about women in the tech industry. <laughs> Now, Lorraine Stein started her career at the age of about 24 years old, and she started a tech company. Sounds cool, the only difference is she started it 30 years ago here in Cape Town. So she's got a wealth of experience, so I'm really looking forward to hearing her insights. Um, she's also been the top 10 IT personality of the year, and get this, she was the first female Delphi certified, who remembers Delphi? Hands up in there, Delphi, yeah? First female founder Delphi certified developer in the world, guys, in the world. <laughs> guys, please stand up, give a massive round of applause for Lorraine Stein, woo! Where is she, where is she, there we go. And, and who's gonna be interviewing her is, tonight I'm taking a back seat, I'm gonna be listening to Lelemba. Um, okay, we'll do this again, let's try this again. Uh, Lelemba, where's Lelemba? She's gonna be doing the interview, and uh, Lelemba is Sandra's wife, um, but she is also, the Chief Marketing Officer for Zorna, or otherwise known as Zuna. They do some amazing um, activations in Africa. She's also an award-winning financial educator, an impact investor, and a writer. Guys, please stand up on your feet. There we go, on your feet. Give a massive round of applause. She's an amazing woman. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo! Everybody. I am actually so excited to be here and to be interviewing you tonight. Um, I think as a fellow woman in tech, um, being able to have a conversation with you, uh, who's been in business for 30 years, knowing all of the challenges that just growing a business um, has, and in particular in tech, I think it's such an amazing opportunity for us to be able to hear from you tonight. Yeah. Lilimba, thank you very much. It was nice to know these little things work. <laughs> um, really great to be here. I'm a, I'm a deep introvert, right? I, I self-describe nerd. So you're actually all terrifying, but, but we'll cope with it. <laughs> yeah. I, I think before we kick off into your career, it would be nice for people to get a bit of an understanding of who Lorraine is, where were you born, where, you do, where do you come from? I mean, with all of these accolades, it can sometimes be intimidating to just say, oh my God, who is Lorraine? But so I would like to know, who is Lorraine? Thank you very much. This is the question I like, like the least. I, I love giving you all my opinions on women in tech and all those things. But talking about myself, that's really hard. But um, I started in Johannesburg. So I'm an import into Cape Town, been here about 20 years. And we actually started the company, I'm sorry, G, we started it actually in Johannesburg. But... Um, I was lucky enough in um, high school to actually have computer science. Now, to give you an idea, this was in 1977. There were no PCs. All right. I mean, annually, we would go over to see the, the Department of Education's big mainframe <laughs> and just look at it. <laughs> you know, that, that was as close as you actually got to a computer. So that didn't really spark my interest, to be completely honest. Um, I was much more of a creative person. We thought that to be in tech, you know, you were just this logical person. But um, when I finished high school, I really, really wanted to be independent. That was, <laughs> never mind studying, never mind anything else, I wanted to earn money. Mm. And the quickest way uh, to a good salary those days was to go off and be trained as a programmer. And there was this three-month course in COBOL. If you're battling with Delphi, you're going to really battle with the idea of COBOL. But I went off to this thing, and um, suddenly my eyes just opened to what it was all about, and I just loved it. So kind of that's how I got into tech. <laughs> sure. 
and then deciding to become an entrepreneur at 24. Uh, that's frightening, just thinking about that. What prompted that decision? No, that's when you must do it. Okay. <laughs> After that, you get too scared. <laughs> you should do it while you still know everything. <laughs> but, uh, I was actually exceedingly lucky okay. because in the um, training company that I, I was talking about, they actually hired me um, after the three months training to be part of their little software development mm -hmm. facility that they had. They were trying to keep their hand in. And I thought this was just great. I was 18 and I was like, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So the, the picture in my head was very clear. I was, I was very lucky to find something I really loved. And I could say if you're an entrepreneur and you don't love what you do, it's too hard. Yeah. You just can't do it. You shouldn't be in the, the field. I was also very lucky because it was a quite a diverse group of people. There were students across racial profiles. Yeah. And in, in the 80s, this was still quite a big deal. Mm. So I was exceptionally lucky to start working with cr creative, uh, clever uh, people across all fields. And I think that was quite a, a good thing in my career. Mm -hmm. So um, at 24, where did you get your funding? How did you start? No, you don't have funding, you just don't eat. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, I did have a little funding. What I'd done is I'd been uh, developing a package because we're talking now 1986. Mm -hmm. 1986, from 84 PCs we were out. The, 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 the world was changing, it was a very exciting time. So the IBM PC was something, it existed. Um, I took to that, mm -hmm. and um, from 1984 I started doing little packages for different companies, and I had a, a, a DOS package that was doing very well. So I was still fully employed, but I had this thing going on the side, and I managed to sell the rights to it to the um, Spoonet of the day, mm -hmm. to Transnet, and um, that gave the seed capital to start the company with. And I, I remember resigning. I went to my boss and I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm too busy to work for you. <laughs> <laughs> he was not impressed. <laughs> 30 years sustaining a business. I mean, particularly in tech when things evolve so quickly. Um, what have been your major challenges over the last 30 years? So I think the reason I was happy to talk to a bunch of entrepreneurs is that you never stop being that. Yeah. You, you just have, I have 30 years of being an entrepreneur every year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because if you're in the tech field, you can't get complacent. Yeah. There's, there's no such thing as, oh, let's look nostalgically back at the Delphi days or Cobol days, any of these things. I'd be dead. Yeah. I'd be absolutely dead. So you have to keep reinventing yourself. You really have to thrive on change. And, and if you don't have the stomach for that, you will get left behind. Mm. Were there moments you felt this is the end? <laughs> I, it's been difficult mm. um, building your own company and you have good years and you have bad years. You know, it's not, a, not never an easy thing. My business, our KRS, it's a, everything's unique every year. We do projects for clients. So just when you think you know what you're doing, a new, completely new thing comes along, tech mm. changes and you're doing something new again. So you are always reinventing yourself, and it's eventually you think you're in tech, but you're really in the people business. That's very true. Mm. You know, it's about getting the right partners. I, I feel incredibly lucky. My co-founder is in the audience with us tonight, and our other uh, senior partner has been with us for over 20 years. To find partnerships that survive that long, yeah. I, I think that is probably what I regard as my highest achievement, is that we, we've been able to trust each other. So many s businesses, as they start to get bigger or better, the partners fall apart. Mm. And you can't do everything. So, so continue on that thought. You, you have a passion for something. You've come up with, you, you're good in tech or you're good at something. But now to be an entrepreneur, you must be your own marketer, your own mm. accountant, your own <laughs> everything, right? Mm. Business advisor. Well, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not beyond the garage stage. Mm. So you have to find good partners. You have to find people you trust, and you must be a person that they can trust. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the milestones that you're most proud of as a team? 
I, I guess I'm, the other person in the audience is my son, so I'll, I'll just go with that. I'm, I'm like really proud of him. <laughs> right now he's not proud of me, he wishes I'd shut up. But, uh, <laughs> but I think growing the company, uh, doing work that we found interesting and getting into new fields of tech and always trying to be doing something a little more interesting. The company has now got just over 60 people that, okay. that work for us. We've got uh, a small branch in, up in Pretoria. Uh, we've got a small team actually in Bloemfontein. <laughs> Bloemfontein has tech. <laughs> Doesn't all happen here in Cape Town. And of course a lovely big team here in Cape Town. And we do interesting work mm. you know, across so many different fields. And your client base, where are they? they uh, we have clients in Cape Town. There are some in Johannesburg. It is a little more difficult mm. to sustain a bigger company just based on work in Cape Town. And we have international clients. Mm. You know? I love those euros. <laughs> it's a really good thing. We we also do uh, gym systems. Okay. So we've um, for many many years we've been in the business of, of software for gyms and it's just basic stuff, access control and pay. You know you know what the gym business is about, right? They sign you up and then hope you never come. <laughs> you know that, right? Because the gyms would be too full if if everybody came after Christmas when they sign up. <laughs> so the systems are mainly about collecting the money and controlling access and sending marketing messages and reports. And it's a, it's a little micro enterprise, right? Each gym often is a small startup. It's an enterprise that needs help running its gym. Uh, we've been in that business for many, many years. And why did I start telling you that? Oh, because you asked, I was thinking about internationals. So those are, are clients all over. We have um, up in Africa and, and a lot in this country. I think there's something like 250 gyms that use us. Okay. And well represented. I'll take one of the questions from Slido. Uh, <laughs> how has the Cape Town tech landscape changed over the 30 years? What have you noticed that in some of the significant changes? Everything changed, okay. right? <laughs> I think one of the big differences from when I started was that you didn't have to learn as much. Mm. To be honest, the tech stack is very, very deep now. If you're getting into IT, you can't learn one thing. You can't just learn <coughs> JavaScript. That won't help you. You need to also know HTML. You'll need database skills. You'll probably need to learn about security. The whole web stack. You'll need to talk to a back end. You'll need to learn an API level. It's all these different layers of tech. So it's a very deep stack. And I, I think that is one of the things that slows people down. Um, from getting into the, the field. It is a deep stack. It used to be a little simpler, but I mean, we're still solving problems. Yeah. Y you know, that, that's always what I loved, was the creativity. I'll give you another from the past thing. In high school, I won the Artist of the Year at my high school in matric. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I thought like art and creativity, and I loved it. I was this ang angst-filled teenager, right? doing dark paintings. <laughs> goth, before goth was a thing. <laughs> and uh, then I went into computers and I never drew again or painted again because my creative urges were all satisfied mm. by the ability to go and use this tool to come up with great solutions. So um, drawing into the theme of women in tech, um, are you happy with the number of women in tech uh, right now? At, were you more hopeful when you got into tech that more women will get into the industry? Let's just start with a, a really important thing to remember. When I got into the industry, there were lots of women in tech. Okay. Wow. And a lot of people forget that. When I got into tech, there were about 40% of the field was female. It's gone down, and I never expected that. Mm. I don't think any of us did. I think, I think we all are still surprised because why you know it's not like you need big strong muscles <laughs> have you seen the geeks <laughs> so um, there's other factors at, at play I think and I, and I can go into that if you're happy yes, to please. expand what do you think went wrong there's so many things the, um, there's a clear correlation with um, the invention of the PC the desktop computer and a diminishing number of women. So when PCs were coming out in 
sons were getting these things to play with. There was a gender bias. Mm -hmm. So we hear stories of women who go to varsity and they get into computer science and they find out they're behind their male colleagues, right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important that we have these school programs, whether it's Girl Hut, Codex, mm -hmm. uh, Code for Cape Town, um, the programs that are going out to the schools, they're critical. And I'm not going to be gender biased about this. It's, mm -hmm. it's our boys and our girls yes. need access to computers at school because you must start young. There's a big, deep stack that I talked about. Yes. And then I think there's also some stuff that we as an industry are not doing right. Mm -hmm. So we do get girls coming into the field and they don't stay. So we've got that problem as well. Um, I, I can tell you what I think. I'm, I hope a lot of you have your own opinions. But some of it is this idea that it's a very pressured field. Yes. You know, yes. that it's high pressure and maybe women say, oh, no, you want somebody to work stupid hours, don't ask me. Mm. But it's, that's not it entirely because, for instance, our own company, we believe in sustainable pace. Mm. So um, if there are a few geeks in the audience, we, we, we follow something called agile software mm. development. Mm. And sustainable pace is important. You don't burn out your staff. You know, you don't make them work till 3 a.m. and fall asleep over the PC. Nonsense. Mm. It is a good career, and, and all the money that you can earn in this career, if we're cutting out 50% of the population from those career opportunities, hell, I'm pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see the girls in there. Um, but I, yeah, I think that businesses need to be a little more flexible if they're honest about wanting women back mm. in the tech fields. And we also have a thing we try and do which we learned quite the hard way. We, we have project teams that work for different clients. So we used to say, oh, goody, you know, a woman. Let's put her into that team. There's no woman. Let's have some spread of diversity. It's a really bad idea. It's like throwing her to the blooming wolves, <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right. So we now try and have, we'll rather have completely male teams okay. and then balanced teams where there's support in the team, where as a woman you have a mentor, you have somebody to talk to and support you, right? So we do try and do that as much as possible so that it's, it's not just a case of getting there to the job. You need support as well. And how have you managed to juggle it? Because the impression is that it's hard hours um, working in tech, but you were an entrepreneur, you, you were founding the business and you have a son. How have you managed to balance that? We might need to ask my son if I'm balancing it. I'm not sure. You know, I mean, I don't really believe in this, you know, the perfect woman ma managing everything. I'm very fallible, yeah. and I make time for myself when I need to. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the family has to take a step back because something's going on. Mm -hmm. But it goes in little spurts, if you like, right? Mm -hmm. We focus on the one thing. I can't do everything. I don't think a woman really multitasks. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Beyond brushing my teeth, you know, at the same time as kind of, you know, reading my message. No, I don't multitask. <laughs> Do you involve your son in any of the work that you're doing? So that's a nice one. Mm. A couple of years ago, we mostly worked for corporates. And we wanted a consumer uh, application. We wanted to do some consumer-based, small, uh, at, but at high volume, you know, instead of the, the single big client. And... One of the big pieces of advice I have for an entrepreneur, if, if you want something yourself, it's more likely somebody else will want it. Mm -hmm. So I wanted at that point an app that would tell me what I could do with my kid. <laughs> and we came up with funnearby.com, which is still only in South Africa, but we cover a couple of cities, Cape Town and Durban and, and Johannesburg. And we put out all the events for kids. So you can go onto funnearby.com and you can have a look and we post Literally, I had three to five events per city per day. Oh, wow. Okay. And people send us the stuff, they can upload their own events. And I involved my son in this. Not that he wrote tech, but we would go to places and say, well, that would be a good one, and we'd take pics, or we'd discuss the design of a screen, and he'd say, oh, no, no, no kid would like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think the business experience, right? If you've had uh, people telling you about business right from, from as a youth, it just makes it so much easier. Absolutely. And um, I hear you run an internship program at KRS. What brought that on? And can you tell us a little bit about that? So for the last 10 years, we have taken on 
around about a dozen, 12 to 14 uh, youngsters every single year. And it's, although we call it an internship, it's actually an accelerator program. So if someone's got their diploma or their degree, they've done some IT, but they're battling with that gap between I've now gone and studied, but I need to get my first job. Um, we app test, we, we process like 400 CVs, I must tell you, to get to those 12 people. And then we put them through this accelerated program. And at the end of it, we make sure that everybody is placed. And the accelerated program's two months. And they get paid while they're on it, right? They don't pay for it, right? They, they get money as an intern. And we take some of them on into our company and we place others with companies. Um, I'm not sure they pay for us. Do you think took one of our guys once? Did you get to? Um, so really great companies in, in the Cape Town environment. And it's the lifeblood of our company, huh? It's what keeps us young. And it's a very important thing as you mature as a company it is that you start to lose your young roots. Mm. So we don't. We have the internship and we have all these young people coming in with their enthusiasm and their fresh-faced willingness to just try. And it really is one of the best things we do as a company. I'll take another question from Slido. Um, I did like the one about how does one convince little black girls in the townships of South Africa about a possible future um, in tech? Am I allowed to rant about the cellular companies? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we need data, we need connectivity. Yeah? How can you possibly convince a little black girl or a little black boy or anybody else to get onto this thing if it's not accessible? Um, I was talking to a company we work with in India, and they were telling me that they get, I think it is, three gigabytes per day free. They only have to pay for data after that. Wow. Per day. Wow. All right. We need some disruption. Mm. If any of you here feel like you might be the disruptors, boy, do we need disruption. There's all this material. If you, if you go online, you can get courses for all sorts of things. You can learn JavaScript. You can learn HTML. You can connect up with companies, go hatch them. All these people are doing great stuff, but only if you're online. Absolutely. So if I could just go on a little rant. We really, as a, as a as business, as the government, as the city, any, any activity that gets Wi-Fi coverage out to whether it's schools, further than just the, the libraries that do try their very best, yeah. Um, we need community-based Wi-Fi, and we need cheaper uh, data. I went to a talk, and it, it really stuck with me, where someone was explaining what a smartphone really means to somebody who is doing it on a pay-as-you-go basis. You cannot afford pay-as-you-go data. I mean, it's seriously, and it dribbles away. Have you noticed that? I mean, you start off with, oh, I bought my three gigs, or however many it is. And you don't actually get that usage because there's stuff checking in the background, right? So people then start putting it off. Yes. And I've heard it's called a dead phone mm. in the townships because most of the time you have it off, so it's not busy connecting when it shouldn't be. Is that what we want? You know? Another one that's got getting some votes there. What are the challenges you encounter when servicing international clients? The, the, I mentioned that we think we're in the tech field, but we're really in the people field. So great communication skills are really it. It is so much more difficult to communicate when you're not face to face. And even face to face we mess up, right? We miss each other's point. But um, communication, so we use a lot of tools. We have um, there's Slack and there's um, Skype and there's all these good things. So the, the mechanisms are there. But it's just so much harder when you're not seeing somebody. And there's time zones, language difficulties. And I have a team that refers constantly to the Spanglish that they deal with. <laughs> <laughs> and, and things like that. But it's, it's very real and it's hard. But we are a very attractive destination, you know. And we are, for Europe, we're pretty much on the t same time zone. Yeah. There's not too many language problems. Cape Town's got a good rep for IT. I mean, we're in a great place. It's uh, obviously just having the marketing to reach out is a little more complicated. 
So another interesting one, particularly that you raised that you are self-proclaimed geek. So how do you network as an introvert? <laughs> as you say, you're in the people business. So how do you network as an introvert? I still said to Jonathan earlier, I said I have to, um, I have to hide my inner introvert, you know, for, for something like this. And, and uh, in, in general for me, I, I talk about energy levels. So if there are more moms in the room, do you, do you know that thing where you've not slept for <laughs> nights and, and your energy levels are really low? Mm -hmm. My currency as, as a woman is, is energy. Harboring it and, and being careful with it and caring for my energy and uh, taking time out to get a walk in the forest or whatever it is that replenishes that energy. <coughs> so um, as an introvert, um, recharging my batteries is, is very important. But I, I can mostly hide it. I mean, how am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> Very well. <laughs> Thank you. I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, when you are starting out, one of the biggest challenges is looking for the right partners. Like uh, you get to some point past the garage stage where you need to bring in other people into the business. Could you talk us through how you made that decision? I mean, you've been with some of your partners for 20 years. That's absolutely amazing. How did you choose the right partners? That one's too difficult for me. I, I don't know if I just got lucky or I do believe that you must be a trustworthy person yourself. Mm. And um, we still do business like that where we all start working for clients and we don't have contracting in place. Mm. And then sometimes I think, oh, you know, after all these years, haven't I learned? But sometimes it's better to start and trust. You just set up better relationships. So I know you have to make your own call on that one. Do you always start with you know, you have all the paperwork in case of the divorce, you know, or do you just say, well, by the time it gets to that, I don't want to be with you anyway. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> how, how have you weathered differences and still maintained okay. momentum? That's a great one. And what we did for many, many years, and pretty much still do it now, is that we don't outvote each other. Okay, if you can't, if I can't convince my partners then it's probably not a good idea. And that happens lots, eh? Because I'm, I kind of get all enthusiastic. We're gonna go and we're gonna jump off this cliff. <laughs> and they're gonna know, have you seen where you're going? And you know, would you please prove it to us that it's a good jump? And, and that's been really important. You must have complementary skills. So, yeah. <laughs> We've taken the approach that we must all agree. Mm. That, that you must have such, such passion and such ability to sell your idea internally you can go and sell it outside. That's beautiful. <laughs> Another challenge, I guess, particularly when you're in the tech space, is because of the pace at which things go, it's difficult sometimes to celebrate wins. Do you find the time to celebrate wins? And what are some of the rituals you've had to develop to just not just be going without really reflecting on the growth? Well, we're very lucky because Agile, of course, has a mechanism built in called the retro where you sit down as a team every two weeks or three weeks, whatever your cycle is, and just like, go through what you could improve on. So we have a, a real learning culture in the organization. We also have monthly staff meetings where we all get together, and, and each team reports back. And one of the things they do is they report back on somebody in the team they want to recognize. Mm -hmm. right? We build it into the process that you recognize each other, and you, you say, this person really helped me out a whole, or they did this amazing good work. So it is there you know it's, it's, it's part of remembering to say thank you because yeah. it's so easy to always oh you did that wrong mm. what are all the 99 things i did right and <laughs> um, so i really do believe in that uh, years ago there was that thing called the one minute manager mm. remember it yes, it's yes. all about just you know saying thank you and recognizing recognizing good stuff and um, there's something else i want to tell you i've forgotten <laughs> sorry <laughs> okay I'll, oh i was going to tell you about right I remember if you don't mind. <laughs> so one of the things we've done for pretty close to all 30 years is provide lunch for our staff. Oh. We get a full cooked lunch every single day. Wow. Okay? You don't get a choice about what it is. It's the stew or it's the salads and burgers or it's the whatever it is for the day. But there's a full cooked lunch. And for some of the young guys particularly, I'm going to pick on the young guys at this one, <laughs> but I think it's the only meal they actually get. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And it's a bonding time, right? Yeah. We all stop. And we sit around 
you know, we have like little canteen tables, but they make big tables. Every so often we break them up again, so we need more seats. And then somehow they all just go back together because everyone wants to sit together. And they want to chat a bit. And um, so things like that, long before Google made it fashionable, like <laughs> bean bags and whatever. <laughs> it is really important to have an environment. You spend all day there. Yeah. You know, most of your life. We could at least make it nice. That's a lot of pressure sometimes um, for newer businesses to be competitive, uh, like trying to do the similar things when you're still watching your cash flow, right? And if you've done it from the start, how did you work that out that it remains a priority and that it's not slipping away when you are tied down on cash flow? Because I think all my staff would leave. <laughs> I think we stopped serving lunch or we just said thanks. <laughs> It's a really important part of our culture. Uh, you have to protect that. Yeah. You have to value it and protect your culture. It's quite interesting because of this intake of youngsters every year, mm -hmm. that if you're not focused on the culture that you value, right, and you must speak about it explicitly, it won't survive growth. So we, we have a whole process where um, a couple of months after a new batch of interns has joined the company, mm -hmm. we have a culture workshop. And we go through talking about each person, you know, put it, they'll break into groups and they'll say, these are good things, these are bad things, these we could fix, this we value. And we try and make sure that we keep on repeating what we value. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you forget that you valued trust, you valued these things. And I have another one there, which it is part of the agile principles, but it's so difficult to really do in a business environment. I, I don't think that most companies treat their staff as adults. Mm. Okay. <coughs> You get told what to do. So much of the time, you get told what to do. And, and you get people who may be on high performers at work, but on a weekend, they're like really involved in some community thing, or they, they put all their passion in it. And I've often thought, well, why don't they give that to their business where the money lies? And I think it's because they don't have enough say in their own life, right? You're not given the scope to, to make a difference in a company. You're, you're going to be measured by your KPI or KPA, whatever it is. And... You know, uh, you're not measured for the things you've maybe done that weren't on that. Mm. I think it's a terrible mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> it only gets the behavior you ask for. Mm. So we, a small company has every advantage for keeping staff. Mm. Because you can trust people. You can deal with them one-on-one. -on -one. It's keeping that um, honest belief in people as you grow. Mm. That's the challenge. Mm. <laughs> so how do you manage... Um, bigger companies headhunting from your company? <laughs> I, have a, 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 I have my own little fan club. I'm, I'm really grateful that a bunch of the, the guys have come to, to listen to me tonight. So we might have to ask them. But it, it, I, I've said for a long time that we don't compete that often with the other software development companies in, in Cape Town for business. There's a lot of business around. We compete for staff. Mm. Right? Uh, finding and, and, and keeping good people is critical. So I, I just hope we value them enough, guys. I, I mean, really, I believe we value you. And <laughs> just tell them to go away. <laughs> but it is, it, you know, salaries are, are the, the biggest thing that you have to work with. And if you're a startup, you either have to have partners and, and you're all on eating, mm. you know, <laughs> or you must have funders and really look after the staff because the cost of replacing someone if you've, if you've been working on something and that person says, okay, I'm done, and you have to bring somebody else into it, it's disruptive, right? Yeah. That cost of replacing is huge, huge, huge. So I just don't think we always look after our people well enough, and I hope we do. <laughs> have you raised any funding over the years? You touched on either raised funding. Have you raised funding over the years? No, no we, we've been really self it's a self-growth story, which maybe is why we're only 60, we're not 600. <laughs> but, but I also think we've, we've had a focus on doing things that we found fun. Okay. So could we have got bigger? Probably. Um, but we've done some really exciting systems. We've, we've got involved in all sorts of things from, and, and lots of lovely blue chip plants. And, you know, uh, we also get approached quite often from companies or, or individuals who've got ideas for startup. I did see something going past a while back about how do you, how do you protect, protect your novel idea your whilst idea. reaching out to others for help. Right. So I have a simple thing there, your idea's worth nothing. Yeah. <laughs> True. We all got ideas. Mm. All of us have got ideas, right? Mm. 
It's what you can execute on. Don't worry about protecting your idea. Just get going, right? And I, I listened to a very wise man who talked about strategy, uh, one of the captains of industry in, in this city. And he said, you know, it doesn't really matter what strategy you pick, so long as you really go for it. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's your strategy to go that way or to go that way. We'll just do it 150%, you know, 200%. So it's all about execution. If you've got this great idea, bring it to market. Yeah. And I met Gilam uh, first because I went to a lean startup weekend. Okay. And uh, I, was, I thought it was the best thing I'd ever heard. Because we do in IT, we, start, we, we want to develop, right? Mm. The trouble with code is they like to code. So <laughs> we, we, we're happy to write stuff, but now we must get out there and market it. We must see who wants our idea. Mm. So what's the smallest thing you can do? What's the littlest thing you can do? And then you can take it to market mm. and find out if, you know, actually then we'll pay you real money for it. <laughs> and I, I really love that. Lean startups is, you know, actually try and sell something you don't have. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, if you can find someone, because everyone tells you it's great, would you buy this? Yeah, yeah, I'd buy it. <laughs> okay, will you pay me money now? Oh, no, 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 not, not for me. <laughs> right? So, as entrepreneurs, you must actually go and make people pay. You can give them their money back if you really have nothing. But, I mean, almost go that far. Make sure that somebody really wants your, your idea and will pay for it, because we all have ideas. I really like that. I think because a lot of entrepreneurs, when they're starting out, worry about, let's sign an NDA before I can share any information about my business with you. I need your help, but I can't really come to you because I don't want my idea out. So that's a really important point, that that doesn't matter as much as you being able to execute on it. Yeah. I'm going to open up the questions to the crowd as well. Um, anybody, okay. G has the mic over there. So anybody have any questions? And whilst we're waiting for that, we'll take yes, one. Yes, I still could. If you were, oh. <laughs> okay. When I'm allowed to. <laughs> I, I would be really, really happy if I was allowed to code more. But uh, yeah, I, I, my SQL skills are still, still sharp. <laughs> There's one over here. Hi, Lauren. Um, Hi. I interviewed you yesterday or the day before from Benjamin. I'm um, okay. Daniel. Hi, Daniel. So, you mentioned the gender bias in the tech industry, right? And I just wanted to find out, did having um, a male co-founder help? <laughs> well, we were very cynical about it in the days when we used to go out to clients. We'd decide whether this particular client would do better with a, you know, a lady <laughs> or a guy. <laughs> but I think... No, I think we, I mean, we've always been equal partners, and um, I was very lucky with a very, very technical partner, but I, I am, as I say, also a technical person. So if anything, we probably were a bit short on the marketing side. And just the woman in tech thing, and I, I expand on that slightly. There are a lot of women in tech. If you look at on the project management side or scrum masters, business analysts, things with high people and communication levels, there are a lot of women, marketing, in tech fields, right? What, what we don't have <laughs> are a lot of um, technical women. And so I tend to think about that a little bit differently. It's the programmers, it's the developers, it's the architects. It's at those levels that we need to get it's STEM, right? It's mm -hmm. the STEM stuff that we need to, to ra um, raise. So I sometimes say it's not a problem of, of women in tech, it's a problem of tech in women. <laughs> okay. I want more, more technical women in the field and everything we can do to support, to yeah. support that. Okay. Whilst he's taking the mic, if you were to start a business today, what would you do differently? No, I don't, I don't know if I'd do anything really differently. It's that we're still doing, you know, every year we have to reinvent ourselves anyway, but you have to have that passion. You have to do something you really love. It's, it's got to be worth it. Otherwise, you must just work for someone. Really. This is much too hard yeah. to do it if you don't love it. Yes. So we'll take the question. Oh, hi. Um, it's me again. Hi, Rita. Um, I'm going to say something that I'll regret saying in future. <laughs> I, ne I never, never used to attend women in tech events, ever. 
and I've never wasted my time networking there. And purely because I had one principle. Most of the people that have held my hand in Cape Town were males. Till, till this day, it's like I got the biggest support from males who gave me office space, that hold my hand. And I sometimes wonder, are we pushing from a wrong angle? Or what is it that we're doing that women are not willing? Oh, oh they are there, but maybe they're not as open as we want them to be. And I always say, why should I waste my time with people who are not going to invest in me when literally most of the white males are the reason I'm still standing here 14 years later? I, I really get you. Um, I, I also don't like the, the discussion specifically about women in tech. Um, but if we have to do something to have role models, to make sure people are aware of them again, um, but yeah, your mentors can come from anywhere, and, and I think we all would say that the mentors we've had, uh, yeah, <laughs> male mentors, female mentors, if there is a distinct problem that if you don't have enough women at the more managerial and executive levels, who's going to mentor you if that's where you're going to end up? Mm. Um, so I do support the women in tech events uh, to some extent, but I, I do sometimes find them not technical enough. Mm. The, the, it's, we, we're talking about a very broad field, and there are a lot of women in that field. So, you know, let's just move on from that one. Mm. Is there anything that you do as an organization to ensure that you are growing the pool of women getting into management positions? Because what you raise is really important. Uh, having role models, but also having um, mentors who are at more senior levels. Is there anything that you particularly do at KRS to create a path? Look, there, there is, I think one of the nice things is that um, I will often, when I'm talking to some of our female staff, um, because I relate to them, right? Yeah. And so there's no barrier mm. to anybody going up because we have me in, the, in that seat, we have a, a mix in our directors. So I think the most toxic environment is where it is perhaps all white male, maybe. Right. I'm sorry to pick on you guys. You're important too. We didn't we love you, but it's just that it, on mass, I don't love you as much. Um, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so when an organisation hasn't got any transformation, got any diversity in it, um, it becomes difficult for anyone to break into that. So it's important to us to keep in mind when we're looking at our interns that we're bringing in the right people and that it's giving opportunity to everyone. And we have done that consistently through the whole company's career you know, existence. There was another question around how do you reinvent yourselves as a company, particularly going into the future? What are some of your plans tied into that? What are some of your plans going forward? You said you were going to talk to me a little bit about the future, and I, I've mostly thought about this in terms of the 30 years and <coughs> what I wanted to tell people. But it's, you have to keep growing. You know, we, we are on a growth path. We are. We have looked at uh, additional niche markets we've got into, and, and to keep growing the staff, uh, because we have to keep giving those opportunities to the next generation as well. <laughs> so I don't have any any slick one-liners for you really on this one, but just keep on working hard. You know, you keep on growing because if you're not growing, you uh, you can't really stand still in this market, can you? Mm. And you, you're either going forward or you're sliding back. And we don't want to slide back. We've been a lot of work getting this far. And, and we know so much. It's, it's an interesting thing that you start to realize how much you do know. And you take it for granted. But when you start out, um, you don't even have a photocopier. <laughs> you, you know, it's the most basic stuff getting in your way. I need to send somebody something. And I have to run around to print shops, right? <laughs> if you're a brand new entrepreneur, everything, everything's a problem. And at some point, you just realize that you have a, a way of doing your mentoring. Mm -hmm. You have a way of maintaining your culture and recognizing it and celebrating things. You have award proof. You have everything in place. You know? yeah. So um, we, we really value that, and we want to keep growing you know, on that, that basis. But, but keep it personal. So the question was reinvent your software, particularly, ah. to cope with the market no longer wanting to make investment in on-premise systems. Okay. 
how would you reinvent no, well, that's, that's not even reinventing. That's just where we are already. <laughs> okay. Everything's in the cloud. Uh, you must have web skills. Yeah. And um, it's constant. And it'll be something different next year. And I was asked, I think Daniel asked me about Bitcoin, you know, and the blockchain. Sure, it, it's really exciting. I think the blockchain's a really exciting thing. But it's the applications that we're going to come up with. It's just another tool. Mm -hmm. These things are just another tool. So we can talk about Internet of Things, and, and we've been having a lot of fun with mobile. I, I think mobile is very exciting. You have to think differently mm -hmm. because you can't type stuff in on a mobile. You know, it's um, you have to think of better ways of asking your your user base for input, like location services, like you know, take a picture of your problem. Don't describe it. You have to think differently, and, and we are doing that, and, and we're doing that next year with whatever yeah. that is mm -hmm. too. You mentioned something interesting to me that you you don't particularly do a lot of marketing and that you've somehow managed to have more business than you, you can even handle over the years. That's a great problem to have. How, how have you found yourself in, in that position as a business? So we, we do tend to keep clients very long. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's really great that we, we build relationships. Mm -hmm. Same as with your staff, you're building relationships. It's about people. We build relationships with our clients. And uh, you know that, that gives you a very stable business. But yes, we do market, and we do have to do things, uh, you know, and uh, get out there. And I have to put my in introvert self away and, and come and talk to people <laughs> occasionally. But uh, yeah, the, the, the business is out there. There's such a skill shortage that if you cannot go and provide services in IT to companies now, I you know, have to ask what you're doing, yeah. because people are desperate for these services. There's, the skill shortage is real, you know. But we do try not to sell uh, what we call body shopping, if you know the term. <laughs> and we prefer to provide solutions to companies. Because if you body shop, what you're doing is you're saying, I have this really good person and you could have them at you know, this rate. Mm. And then they start to identify with the other company. And there's no like, warranty on the work they're doing if they kind of have a wobble and life's not going well and they're all on their own at the client. So we don't think it's a really great way to, to deal with our staff. So we, we prefer to work project-based. Okay. Rather than body shopping, there's such demand. Okay. Any another question from the crowd? Yes. Uh, hi, Lauren. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Let me see the light. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and just probably to the point you just made now about skills shortages in the IT sector. My question was actually going to be on in the near future, assuming data has fallen and all the things that probably need to change now, do you kind of see the role of developers or coders changing or evolving and then sometime in future when we get past the skills shortage where it's almost commodified to an extent whereby lawyers could probably be coming into law firms with skills to code, kids are being taught how to code at school at grade five and so forth. As in, where would developers or people that kind of specialize in development be adding more value in future as opposed to now where they are probably still in great demand and not so many people can do what they do at the moment? Thank you. Look, I think that um, we have already changed the kind of things we develop. So we're, we spend a lot more time gluing things together, if I can put it that way. So there's a great payment gateway which we want to integrate with a great website. So the, the work is often in interfacing and integrating things. So it is changing because there's a, a lot of packages out there, but there are a lot of companies who want something special. They want their own special solution. And when you look at something like Uber, it's the easy example, mm -hmm. but they completely changed the, the business, right, of, of providing uh, public transport by thinking about uses and take. So I think completely think that everything's going to be commodified or there'd be no disruption. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense to me. What I do think is important is that we are all in IT. Mm -hmm. Whether you just use your, your smartphone to make phone calls or do WhatsApp or something, we, you, everybody uses it at least. So there's a big decision for people, are you going to be a user or a creator? Yeah. Which side of the fence do you want to be on? Mm -hmm. And if you can create, if this is a skill you feel you're drawn to, you have that, it's a weird one, eh? it's, a, it's a combination of creativity and logic mm. that make the best programmers. So if you think you're like a really rational, logical person, but you've got this creative side, 
then you're, you're, you're on the creative side, yeah. okay? You know, put, go and do the studying and, and get into code because it's exciting and it's an enormously uh, rewarding career and, and you can go as high as you want. You can become a CIO and CTOs and uh, start your own company and become, you know, Bill Gates. <laughs> Whatever your particular one is that you want to do. There are no limits. Mm -hmm. There are no limits at all to this particular career. Which is why I get so upset when girls are not in it. <laughs> There's another Very question time. here. Very tough one. What criteria do you use to make employees? We we have a, a, a logic thing that we make them do. They have to sit down for an hour and <coughs> do puzzly things and, and stuff for us to look at logic and and then communication skills. There's a, a, a we we value people who can communicate. I don't think that the uh, nerdy guy in the back corner who doesn't talk to anyone is as much use to anyone. <laughs> Can I just follow up and say, if they don't have um, a certificate or an accredited um, something to prove that they are real coders and they are self-taught, you know, like there's too many people who are teaching themselves these days. Oh, I, I love self-taught people. Do you just... Yeah. Okay. So I, I understand that, you know, there's, a, there's educational inflation, mm -hmm. right? So what you used to be able to get a good job with maybe just a matric certificate or a basic diploma, it's, there's so much competition for jobs that now you have to go and get a degree. Absolutely. But the degree itself is only to get you in the door. Mm -hmm. it, as, as IT people, the degree does not make you a good coder mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. It may teach you better theory, perhaps, than someone completely self-taught, mm -hmm. and maybe some gaps, but it's, um, it's a creative skill, right? It's ability to take those tools, language, and solve a problem in it. And you don't learn that adversity. You do not learn that adversity, and I think that's also why often it's so difficult to get the first job, because you've done all the studying, but the practical experience and getting better, that's why you get an increased salary every year, right? Because you don't start out good. <laughs> you actually start out terrible. You think you've done all this, you've spent all this money on this degree, and you're still terrible. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> right? It's the practical. I believe we're running over time. Yes. But um, I don't value the degree as, as much as some companies do. I think obviously it shows that you're willing to learn. Mm. But that's it in IT. Remember, <laughs> <laughs> we talk too much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think it's really been a valuable conversation. So please, let's give Lorraine a round of applause. Thank you, everyone.